This awesome. conference will now be recorded. And uh, we've had a, a whole year of webinars because we had to cancel last year our, uh, our uh, Western Regional Symposium, but we've invited back all of our speakers who were um, scheduled to speak. And uh, so this is our 11th uh, webinar this year. We have two more coming up. Mark your calendars for May 14th for our safety webinar and June 11th for our Alternative Technologies and Robotics webinar. And that will wrap up our we webinar series for the year. We're gonna take a little bit of a break over the summer and come back with more webinar and workshop content uh, in the fall. First of all, we would like to appreciate the support of our sponsors, including Rethink Waste, Salinas Valley Solid Waste Authority, Recology and HDR, who have uh, contributed to uh, sponsor this webinar series. 100% of the revenues have gone to the um, SWANA Local T um, Legislative Task Force, uh, which is our lobby presence in Sacramento. Not too late to become a sponsor of our webinar series and or our workshop series in the fall uh, at the $1,500, $750, or $250 range. This is just a way of contributing back to SWANA, to the, to the Northern California chapter, and to our legislative task force. So we encourage you to uh, become a sponsor by emailing Christine Wolf, our, um, our sponsorship chair. Here's some tips on how to participate in the webinar. We are asking everyone to mute, and uh, you'll probably get um, better uh, connectivity if you also um, stop your video. You can um, highlight who's talking by hiding everyone, and that way you can see the person who is talking and, uh, below their slides, and you can see their videos. Use the chat area for questions. I'll be monitoring the chat, and between the different uh, presenters today, we'll ask a few questions, and then if we have time at the end, we can open it up and ask more questions. So send the question to everyone. Uh, if your question is for a specific presenter, please go ahead and put their name in the chat. And um, let me know if you would like to be called on or um, and unmuted, or if I'll just answer the question. If we're short on time, I, I mean, I'll ask the question. If we are, um, if we have a little bit more time, we can uh, go with the uh, unmute function. So we're going to start it. Um, here's our, um, our our committee. Uh, this is our programs committee and our workshop committee, which includes Cecilia Rios from the city of San Jose, Christine Wolf from Recology. She is behind the scenes doing the um, webinar hosting function today. So thank you, Christine. Ruth Abbey, myself, um, Kimberly Cook, and uh, Tim Ribley, who's on the line here. He's been our program's chair for the year. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to read the, um, the uh, speaker bios and introduce to you our first speaker. So our first speaker will be Dave Ghirardelli, who first became a member of the SWANA in 2098. I'm sorry, 1998. Uh, so that's been a while, Dave. He has worked in the solid waste management industry for 30 years in both the public and private sector. He has piloted innovative projects and established numerous programs in both North Carolina and California. He lives in Sacramento in the, in, and in Valley Springs with his two sons, and is in his spare time, he grows wine grapes. He has served on the Gold Rush Chapter Board of Directors for the last several years. We will next hear from Mabel Oyoung, who has 10 years of experience in the zero waste and sustainability industry. She is the Environmental Programs Manager with Zero Waste Palo Alto, currently overseeing the deconstruction ordinance implementation and administrating the Palo Alto's waste collection contract. Prior to that, she managed the budget for the Environmental Services Division, supporting the Refuse Fund, the Stormwater Management Fund, and the Wastewater Treatment Fund for Palo Alto Public Works. She also held multiple positions with hands-on outreach experience at the local government, a waste hauler, and a nonprofit. Uh, last up, we will hear from Rachel Davis, who is a civil engineer and has worked in solid waste management industry since 1999. Her career has spanned consulting, serving as a California Integrated Waste Management Board advisor, and now local government, where she serves as the senior engineer for Kiefer Landfill, a county-owned and operated landfill. In 2018, she and her husband deconstructed 
their 1940s era's home uh, with a goal of recycling as much as possible. So we're really looking forward to hearing from our presenters today. And first up will be Dave. Thank you, Ruth. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay, and I'm sharing my screen right there. Does everybody see my first slide? Looks good, Dave. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction, Ruth. And um, uh, welcome everybody to the 11D somethingth uh, presentation and webinar on Western Regional Symposium. I, I appreciate if you're not a member uh, for tuning into SWANA. Um, if you are not a member, I encourage you. I've been a member for a long time, and one of the things that I find wonderful about this organization is just the sheer brain power that is around. If when you get around a bunch of Swana folks, um, uh, it really helps to inform everybody in the industry. We share experiences and expertise. Uh, great organization, and um, I hope uh, if you're new to us you will uh, join. It's a, a, a great, great group. My name is Dave Ghirardelli. I work for Sacramento County. And one of the things I do is run the C&D programs. And uh, we are uh, adapting to a, a, a new environment that's uh, changing the whole world of waste these days. So a little bit about the, the programs we have. We have a, a somewhat unique C&D program in that we have a regional authority, which will be dissolving soon, and the county will be taking over responsibilities, that certifies our sorting facilities. And I emphasize the word sorting in that there is a difference between C&D recycling and C&D sorting. C&D recycling can be just a concrete crushing yard making ABC. Sorting is picking through the sticks and stones to make sure that the recoverable material out of the, the, the contractor who just has room on the job site for one bin and getting that material extracted. We certify sorting facilities. Every local jurisdiction will rely on that certification program to keep from having a different certification program in every single city. As you all are probably well aware, building permits are in essence a land use entitlement and jurisdictions defend the sovereignty over land, uh, land use entitlements almost as fiercely as they defend um, uh, sovereignty in things like law enforcement responsibilities. But they rely, all the jurisdictions in the region rely on the SWA and soon to be counties certification for facilities to guarantee their building permit applicants Calgary in compliance. And uh, that's that it, it that. It, Having two programs, having a, a local government program that's responsible for ensuring Calgary compliance on the building permit side and having a facility certification side really enables you to leverage your C&D programs to have a broader impact, an impact above and beyond Calgary, which is what we have tried to do. So along comes 1383, and we have a couple of angles where C&D is going to be impacted. And I'll get into you know, some of the details and how and some of the, the specific things you can do to move your, your program towards 1383 compliance in a bit. But I'd like to start with a little bit of a, a, a graphic here. There are C&D types of materials, not just strictly from Calgary projects. So you have construction projects that generate, whether they are Calgary covered or not, they generate C&D materials, which include recyclable materials. There's also the commercial sector. 
which is a variety of business. And commercial waste is nowhere near as predictable as the residential waste is. Every business is different, but a lot of them produce a fair amount of recoverable C and D type materials, which include organics. So what are the organics in C and D? You have traditionally predictable C, recoverable CND debris, such as scrap metal, drywall, inerts, plastic. And then you have organic material, which is regulated by 1383, the food waste, the green waste, but both also include the wood waste and the cardboard. They are regulated from a variety of different angles. And so how do you implement 1383 programs that are required by CalRecycle without disrupting your existing programs. Now, I'm hitting you guys with a lot of Venn diagrams, and I love Venn diagrams almost as much as I love a good map. So yeah, let's all just take a moment and really look forward to the day when we can go out and enjoy live music again. Heavy sigh. Okay, where was it? Oh yeah, c and Cal Green and the 1383 regulations. This is where uh, it is referenced and cited. According to the 1383 regs, a jurisdiction must adopt the Cal Green ordinance. Most jurisdictions already have. We have already done that in Sacramento County. We did it several years ago. Actually, we were way ahead of Cal Green. We have a couple of differences. We actually go a little bit beyond Cal Green and then we cover demolition. I will talk about that later. Cal Green is not a C and D ordinance. It is a C ordinance. In two sections, there is a carve out for haulers working on Cal Green projects and they're compliant with 1383 as long as they comply with Title 24, which is Cal Green, the Cal Green Building Code. As a nuance, on the facility side of the regulation, regulation in 1383, C&D must be kept separate from facilities, no matter whether it's Calgary covered C&D or not. Um, I have assurance from CalRecycle that that does not mean you have to separate the wood and the cardboard before it gets to the facility at any facility that might process both. Again, I had a, a couple of good conversations with the folks at CalRecycle and, and you've heard, many of you who have heard me, you know, kvetch about the 1383 regulations. I, I really appreciate the work that the CalRecycle folks at LAMD specifically have done to try to reassure us and help us kind of uh, light the path towards uh, a, a compliance that does not disrupt existing programs. So as I mentioned, organic materials do exist in the CND, specifically wood and cardboard. However, there are a variety of other types of generators other than Calgreen projects that produce this material. And again, if your CND ordinance has a facility certification program to it, then you can leverage and probably already have been leveraging the diversion of those materials through your C&D lines in your region. They are, for example, small projects. They're either permitted and under the Cal Green threshold or they're not permitted. For example, the, the person who's doing boredom cleaning and pandemic boredom renovations inside the garage. I'm gonna tear out these cabinets and put in shelves. Well, that's gonna produce cardboard and wood and it's likely to be self haul. We also have commercial sources of C&D type material. Think of the open top container that's behind the, the big box hardware store or the cabinet shop or the truss manufacturer. A lot of C&D type materials there's a, in the commercial sector. There's NCU and bulky items, which you pick up, which most jurisdictions, almost all of them, provide that service either 
by themselves or through a, 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 a contractor working on their behalf. There is also illegal dumping, which we will talk about. A lot of illegal dumping material includes the organics, cardboard boxes, and clean wood waste. So organic materials, again, as just to reiterate, small project waste is usually self-hauled, and permitted projects have a point of contact already. There are some education and outreach requirements in 1383 that I'll talk about in a second. And if you have a C&D program and you need to do outreach to projects that are below your Cal Green threshold or whatever threshold you've set for coverage, you have a point of contact. Uh, Cal Recycle has said, if you have that point of contact, use it for your education and outreach. So work on a, a, a relationship with your building inspections department if you don't already have one. Commercial sources, the hardware stores and cabinet shops, et cetera, are usually hauled by commercial franchisees. And so you have several points there. NCU and bulky item collection, they need education, outreach, and oper operational changes in order to make them work. However, all of this C&D type material can be processed by the same types of facilities and equipment, your C&D MERPs. Briefly on the, on the specific type, small permitted projects, again, often self-hauled, you, uh, your permit point of contact at the building inspections department is very, very useful and will be one of the centerpieces that you will be expected to have in terms of your meeting your outreach and education obligations in 1383. And it, it should specifically talk about wood and cardboard, the organic materials. Um, and at the same time, pitch your C and D sorting facilities because they'll get your metal and your drywall and your concrete and brick and block and, and, and your other materials as well. However, at, in the final measure, it will be done at facilities. Uh, one thing that is of note in the regulations is that self haulers must haul in a manner that is just as compliant as for commercial haulers. Now, the way that sentence in 18984.9A2 is written, it's a classic case of a dangling participle, and it's hard to really determine exactly uh, what is, is meant by it. However, the, cite, the citation made, 18988.1, in Article 7, do, is the article regarding hauler regulation. So I think the regulatory intent is intact and self-haulers must haul in a manner as compliant as commercial haulers do. That's important. Commercial sector uh, generate, ooh, wait a minute, I think I might have missed it. Yeah, small unpermitted pro permitted projects. Small project waste usually self-hauled. There's no point of contact for education outreach. You will meet this by making sure organic material recovery education and outreach is done in concert with everything else you do websites brochures signage uh, just weave it into the other campaigns because there are a lot of including your um uh bulky item pickup brochures because a lot of people will get those they'll look at the website and say well I, and they'll make the, the the balance they'll say well do i want to use up my once per year for example NCU pickup or bulky item pickup, or do I want to just throw this in my in my brother's pickup truck and take it myself? Include the 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 mandates that the the wood, the metal, and all organics, because there will be a lot of brush in that material as well, need to be recovered. But again, this is self haul. It will largely be measured at the facilities. Commercial sector generators. This is usually collected by franchisees. You have multiple points of contact for education and outreach, use them all. You can adjust your franchise agreement language to reflect this. For those of you who have not prepared your franchise agreements for the 1383 environment yet, 
compliance by the haulers is required. So they will need to adhere to, and I don't have the citation with me at the moment. Sorry, I, the last minute I did not look. It's, it's in the regs. Uh, there are hauler requirements. They will be held to those. And also it will be measured at facilities. Bulky item NCU. Uh, this is where another, a, a fair number of C and D type materials also appear. It's usually conducted by the municipality or by a franchisee who's working on their behalf. The education and outreach opportunities um, and requirements are, well, the requirements are outlined in 1383. Take advantage of that. Work the organics requirements into your outreach for your illegal, I mean, excuse me, for your bulky item pickup material. However, in implementing this, some operational changes are likely to be necessary, much like as is done with white goods. That was a, a, a classic, you know, the, some appliances were first put out with uh, NCU. Some programs don't accept appliances at this point, largely because of this. But the crews just in time got used to put those on this side of the truck and put them in the appropriate place at whatever facility the, the bulky item collection loads are going. One thing that is notable, a lot of illegal dumping is construction debris, or it is these other types of gener waste generating activities. And in Sacramento County, we've just recently adopted our code. We just adopted our 1383 in, uh, ordinance, actually just earlier this week. Illegally dumped material is categorically exempted in Sacramento County. We do not anticipate an argument with Cal Recycle on that point. However, the regulations are relatively silent on it. Um, so that's kind of our story and we're sticking to it and um, we'll see what happens. Okay, so in, in short, again, you guys have heard me kvetch about 1383, probably more than you care to, but I do see a path forward here and the the folks at CalRecycle have been very responsive and I, it's, it's you know, Kara and her crew are, are greatly appreciated. A couple of things that are very, very uh, high priority, if you can get these done, you're golden. If your certified C&D facilities can qualify as the high diversion organic waste processing facilities, and what's that acronym, the HADAOP, uh, if, if they can get qualified as that, and most C&D lines will be able to perform at that level, it's 50% by 2022 and 75% by 2025, I believe. Uh, double check those citations to be certain. If you're not, if you're running a C&D sorting line and you can't hit those numbers, you're not running your C&D sorting line well, in my opinion. But um, so they should be able to meet if your certification program and the facilities you've identified for your generators as their path to Calgreen compliance can also meet that standard, you should be golden. Of course, augment your C&D outreach uh, through your building inspections department for specifically all your lower than Calgreen threshold projects augment your bulky item and self-haul outreach and make the operational changes needed and then this is critical ask your local assistance and market development person for your facility sampling protocols exactly how that's implemented at every solid waste facility in the, across the state of california is going to be hard to make sure it is entirely consistent across the board so work with your local LAMD person. They are here to help. Lastly, there are a couple, I, I, you know, I peppered these guys with questions and 
in 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 all empathy, they they are in uncharted territory as well. And there were a couple of questions I got somewhat uncertain answers to. The first is for generator waivers. The 10 gallon requirement, the de minimis, I believe it's called, um, whether that is going to be measured to include the wood, and we're talking about our hardware stores and our cabinet shops again here, uh, whether that includes the wood and the OCC or not will determine whether they also need to have a food waste program for the nine people that you know toss out half-eaten cupcakes and maybe a banana peel every week, um, whether they're required to have a food waste program. I think they're you know they're receptive to our encouragement that we really need to focus on preserving the programs that are functioning well. The other one that's a little tricky, organic material component of C&D fines. Um, every C&D processing facility is going to produce a lot of fines. And as somebody who not only is a composter and a C&D professional, but also a farmer, C&D fines is not anything we want going into the compost feedstock. And I'm going to be heretical and anybody can take me to task offline on that, but that material does not belong in the, in the compost feedstock and using it as cover at a landfill is an ideal use for that type of material. Whether Cal Recycle is going to start to want to sample that material for its organic compound, content, it remains a little bit sketchy. Demolition projects. This is a weird one because we're fortunate in Sacramento County, our C&D ordinance covers all the all full-scale demolition projects full structure demolition projects. Cal Green does not. Like I said earlier, it's a C ordinance, not a C and D ordinance. If you do not cover your demolition projects, you can, it, it, it will be tricky to navigate how much of the organic material, namely the lumber, has to be recovered from demolition projects. And then of course, illegal dumping material, the regs are relatively silent on it. But these, these unanswered questions kind of prompts me, uh, we wanted to do this technical program a little bit less of the SWANA person talking and pontificating and more of involvement from either members or folks who are just visiting for the webinars. Don't be shy. I'm going to open up for, for questions in a moment here, but if oh, you... Well, in the interest of time, Dean, we're going to wrap up now. Perfect. <laughs> and we're going to um, put hold the questions to the end and or put your questions in the chat for Dave. There Perfect. are the questions, comments, and emotional outbursts. Go ahead and put those in the chat. Dave will respond via the chat, and we'll keep going in the interest of time to keep us here under an hour. Uh, thank Perfect. you so much, Dave, and uh, as usual, very important and entertaining presentation. Uh, <laughs> next up, we have Mabel, um, and Mabel will talk to us about the relatively new uh, construction, demolition, and deconstruction ordinance being implemented by the city of Palo Alto. So, Mabel, take it over. All right. Can you can you hear? Hear me and see me okay and my screen? Looks good. All right. Well, uh, hi everyone. My name is Mabel Aoyang. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, I am with City of Palo Alto, the Zero Waste Group. And I'm here to talk to you guys about deconstruction and construction materials management ordinance. So that's a full name, but we'll refer it to the deconstruction ordinance. Um, and it's um, relatively new to our city here, so let's see. All right, so these are a few key points I wanna cover. Um, we'll talk about the ordinance background, um, the requirements, how do we develop the details uh, using some permitting data with, um, with our planning and building department. 
and our review process um, for all of these um, de de deconstruction projects. So prior to the deconstruction ordinance, um, Palo Alto already had a CND debris diversion program, and that is administered by our planning and building department. Um, under the Cal Green Building Code, the CND debris diversion requirement is at least 65% diversion um, for, for construction buildings and uh, demolition projects. In October 2016, our city council approved some local amendments um, to the Cal Green Code. And um, as usual, Palo Alto tried to make it even um, more stringent uh, requirements for our city. So all demolition pro uh, permits for whole structure and interior non-structural, as well as building permits with a valuation of $25,000 or more are subjected to the requirement and they have to reach at least 80% um, construction waste reduction. Uh, this also, as part of the amendments, we also require single family homes who are obtaining a demo permit to complete a deconstruction survey. Uh, that is provided by a third party and this survey will list any reusable materials and the values of, of that and a, that survey has to be submitted as part of the demo permit application. So then we know um, that we are looking into reuse as well. So moving on to the new ordinance, um, in 2017, we conducted a very comprehensive waste categorization study, and we found out that 44% of the waste being landfilled from Palo Alto um, they all come from CND projects, and with a zero waste goal to reach 95% diversion by 2030, um, as well as a sustainability climate action plan goals, we realized that we need to really go after these waste coming from the CND projects. So um, we also hope that this ordinance will uh, help us recover valuable building materials and reduce the amount of waste going to landfill, um, just because it make up such a large portion of our waste stream. Our deconstruction ordinance, let's see, did I skip a slide? There you go. Okay, so let's talk about the ordinance itself. Um, the ordinance states that any permit application for a whole structure removal submitted on or after July 1st of 2020 will now be required to deconstruct and sort their waste. Our municipal code ha was adopted in June of 2019 and um, under this ordinance, demolition will no longer be allowed uh, for projects that are being completely removed. So not remodeling, it's the whole house being taken away. Um, we wanna make sure that people are deconstructing um, by systematically and carefully disassembling all the building components. And uh, we, have, we were estimating approximately 100 residential homes and just about 15 commercial projects when we were developing uh, this ordinance. So the ordinance, to require the permit applicants to do a few things. Um, first, they have to uh, schedule an on-site salvage survey, uh, but while they're applying for the permit. So the survey will help identify items that can be donated and reused. And currently, a, a nonprofit organization called the Reuse People are offering this service to conduct those survey. Um, after they got their deconstruction permit um, that they have it issued, they have to deconstruct the building, and we're talking about complete uh, complete deconstruction. Um, all recyclables materials must be sorted, so we are um, asking them to have individual loads of, let's say, carpet, a load of clean wood, drywall, metal, shingles and roofing and such. They also need to prepare and separate out any salvageable and reusable materials and prepare them according to spec that they can do, uh, get them donated and delivered. 
Uh, at the end of the project, um, we also want them to submit document documentations uh, of the reusable materials. So it can be a donation receipt or a certification um, along with the South Beach survey. So then that way we can reconcile what we expected to be recovered and what was actually donated. Um, along with that will be regular weight tax for all the other materials, whether they were disposed of or recycled at um, any city approved facilities. So according to the requirements I just mentioned, you can tell that it's very different from traditional demolition. And the city recognized that we'll have to implement this in different phases. So we turn to our planning and development services department. Um, they administer the permitting process and they help us determine the thresholds and the triggers. What type of project should we be targeting uh, for the beginning initial phase of the, of the ordinance? So we looked at it by project values, um, by project type. We were thinking about, oops, excuse me, um, to, do we start with complete demolition or remodel or even tenant improvement? Um, or do we look into commercial projects or residential? Or should we do both? Um, after reviewing some of the details and like the past um, the past numbers of permits that has been applied in previous years, uh, we want to make sure that our staff have enough resource and time, and that's meaning me and a couple of my staff who uh, kind of chip in for this program. Um, how much can we handle? How many numbers? How many projects um, can we tick? tick on and at the same time not impact too many permit applicants and contractors from the beginning um, as we're introducing this new um, requirements and this new idea really. So what we have decided is that for phase one, which is where we are right now, um, we'll include all whole structure removal projects for both commercial and residential, um, but there's no project value threshold. So anything that falls under that. Um, but we are not including a demo of detached garage or storages because they're so small. We'll probably catch them later on. Um, also, the current ordinance does not apply to uh, the removal of a, a six three dwelling unit. So like the granny units, the guest house. So those are does not fall under our requirements. For future phases, we may be requiring um, some of those um, maybe to look into remodeling and tenant improvement um, could be based on building size and project values, but it's just simply too early to say at this time um, how we would move forward and we'll definitely need, uh, need more data for further analysis and see how this phase one go really. So um, more to come in the future. So I want to talk a little bit about the permit application reviews. Um, you may be interested about that if you are thinking about putting together an ordinance similar to this. Um, we worked, we as in public works staff from Zero Waste, uh, we work with our planning and building division. Um, we got added to the department review routing uh, in Excella, and that's a platform that City of Palo Alto use for permitting, um, permitting routing. Um, we got added to both the demo or deconstruction, I should say, deconstruction permit applications process as well as the plan and entitlements. So we're able to flag some deconstruction permit applications as they come in. We're able to reach out to the permit applicants early on and um, include some of these deconstruction requirements in the condition of approval in the plan and entitlement so they know what, what is coming. And whenever um, the plan and title ones went through and then they're preparing for the permit. Uh, we also developed a few queries and reports within the Excel system to collect data and identify who these uh, deconstruction permit applications are. Um, we screen them by permit type number. We look into the details of the project description. Um, in those description, we're able to also find out the size of the project, and that will help us estimate the waste generation or the tonnage coming from um, different types of projects. 
Uh, and very importantly, we also made the salvage survey uh, a required submittal. So the division of uh, the building division staff, they cannot approve or issue a permit if the salvage survey were not submitted. So um, we'll know that they have done it, they know what they should be salvaging, and then you get your permit issued. So after the deconstruction is over, um, the permit holder also need to upload the initial survey and way tax or tonnage reports, as well as the receipt or, re or certification of the salvage material to Green Halo. So City of Palo Alto has been used, have been using Green Halo for um, managing the waste management plan, um, tonnages and way tax. So planning and building has been using that and because they use that for the existing CND diversion compliance program. Um, and they also use that to make sure that each project reached the 80% requirement that Palo Alto has. So now Zero Waste staff has the access to Green Halo as well. And we also use that to reconcile the survey, the salvage survey to the donation receipt we're able to look at the way tax and the material types to make sure that not everything comes in as mixed CND or just trash. Um, we are expecting to see some um, metal tag, a sheetrock tag, um, some clean wood tag and things like that. So that is um, how we are using Green Halo. So a quick Status update for this very new ordinance. It's been nine months since the beginning of the implementation. Um, we know the projects will be trickling in because of how we set up the effective date, um, but we're seeing a lot less project than expected. And we all know the key, key um, driver is COVID. A lot of the construction project, project has slowed down. Um, so far, only 32 permit applications were submitted since July of 2020. It's under uh, my my um, under the the ordinance that we'll have to uh, make sure they're in compliance. Um, two of them are commercial projects, and three of them uh, three of the residential projects already closed out. Um, as of right now, there's about four to five active projects that's happening um, in town. Uh, I also talked to the general contractors, homeowners constantly to make sure that they know what they're expected and answer any questions um, from everyone that is involved in the project, in the permitting process, and even throughout deconstruction. A few uh, lessons learned that i like to share with you. Um, Due to the way that we set our ordinance effective day, it has caused some confusion to some people. Um, some people may think that, oh, as of July of 2020, any demo jobs will now have to be deconstructed. But that's not true because um, we are looking at the permit application date. If you submitted your, your deconstruction permit app, after July or um, starting July 1st of last year, then when you get your permit issued, that's when you need to deconstruct. So if you have submitted before, even on June 29th, you are okay. But we strongly encourage them to deconstruct even though they are not required whenever I get the chance to talk to them. Um, next, uh, we hosted multiple internal trainings and created FAQ for city staff. Um, that's including public work staff as well as um, planning and building staff to make sure that um, everyone is aware of what their applications uh, requirements are, how, uh, what are we looking at in Green Halo, so if there's questions, they can help answer it. Um, we also created a document that lists all the materials that can be put together or what should be separated, and it's the detailed material, construction material guide. Uh, I have a link for you later on if you're interested. It has been really helpful to have that as a reference, and we developed that with our hauler and Zenker uh, Recycling that's in San Jose. Um, they are a city-approved mixed C&D um, MRF, so um, 
a lot of our materials go to that facility anyways and our haulers send their stuff there if they were um, providing services so that has been really helpful um Ruth how much time do I have left we kind of need to wrap up all right, but this is basically my last uh, slide. Um, if we have any question, we can um, talk about it later on, but basically just addressing how much, uh, how important outreach and, uh, and communication has been and really trying to reach the project team member and the right person um, early on and having on-site meetings has been really great. Um, so here is um, some, Resources that we have put together available online. I'm sure the presentation will be available to you. And if you have any questions, feel free to send me email deconstruction at cityofpaloalto.org. That's excellent, Mabo. And we do have several questions in the chat, so I'm hoping you can uh, spend a little time responding to those while we hear from Rachel. Rachel's going to give us a whirlwind tour of her deconstruction project which was really a hands-on project that she completed and i um, looking forward to your presentation Rachel can you can you see it looks good all right um, so my name is Rachel Davis I'm uh, the senior engineer out at Kiefer landfill and uh, my husband and I in 2018 um, undertook uh, the deconstruction of our home and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it All right, let's see, technical difficult. Oh, there we go. Um, so we purchased the house in 2008. Um, it had been built originally in 1947. Um, the house had been remote modeled a lot of times. Um, um, and ultimately we found after living in it uh, for a bit um, was that a lot of the um, remodeling had um, been covering up a, a decaying structure and ultimately we decided that it just needed to come down. Um, I, th there was a lot of discussion about whether to demolish or deconstruct. Um, I at the outset didn't think that, um, it, it's a big task to deconstruct. I, I didn't think that um, we had it in us, frankly, but my husband uh, convinced me to give him two weeks and, uh, or for us to, to hit it for two weeks. And um, we never looked back. Um, the, the, the crew was uh, my husband, Anthony and I, um, and Anthony's on the call today. Um, and then our two children, and then we received um, some pretty good help from friends and neighbors as well. And our goal was to reuse and recycle as much of the house as we could um, according to its highest and best use for each material type. Um, so our qualifications, um, mainly stubbornness and a willingness to work really hard and um, definitely um, a, a love for recycling. So anytime you, you take on a project like this, you have to be looking at your end markets. So these are the, the end markets um, uh, for where all the material from our house went, um, our new home, Craigslist, Habitat for Humanity Restore, Sims Metal, um, are the roll-off containers that we uh, got. We got two 40-yard roll-off containers during the project, and both of them went to the Green Waste of Sacramento C&D Waste Processing Facility. And then finally, the entire foundation, we jackhammered out and sent to Kiefer Landfill, um, where we use it to build roads around the site. So it, it is a form of reuse. So this is, it's, the project started with uh, drywall removal and I'm gonna jump back and forth between kind of how we deconstructed and then about the material type. So uh, drywall was the first thing to, to come out. It was almost all painted drywall, uh, which went into the roll off container. Um, and then um, any unpainted, which was a very small amount, we uh, reused in our garden for soil amendment. Let's see more drywall removal. So insulation was one of those interesting items. I, I don't think we thought at the outset about like, gee, we can recycle um, our insulation, but um, as the walls came down, we realized that the insulation was really in good material, in good condition. So uh, Anthony had the idea to um, post it on Craigslist and see, you know, see what we got. And we got tons of interest to the point where the, the higher, higher quality stuff he was actually able to sell. Um, and all the blow-in insulation from the attic, we bagged and gave away to a coworker of mine. 
So one of the Craigslist comes up over and over again. Um, we were able to um, get individuals to come and remove the material. Um, so it saved us on labor um, and we made a little money in the process also. So somebody came and actually removed our entire floor for $50. Um, that's them paying us, not the other way around. Um, and then kitchen cabinets, the entire kitchen is now a, a part of a rental in, um, in downtown Sacramento. So this is the, the roofing materials with the comp shingles, tar paper, um, that went in the roll off container. Um, the one by two planks, we, we carefully removed. They were super old um, and we put them into our new house um, in a, like a shiplap style um, walls um, in a few of our rooms. And then um, all of the metal we collected and, um, and took to, to Sims Metal for recycling. So one of the, the things about the way our house was constructed uh, was that um, it was built using um, siding from old refrigerated uh, railroad box cars. So we thought that was pretty cool and we carefully removed and denailed it and um, reused it. Uh, we sold it, we gave it away, uh, but we, we definitely treated it with care. Um, the plywood siding um, or the sheathing and then the, the T111 plywood siding, it was really tough to get off in any type of condition that anyone would want to use. So it went in the roll off container as well. Um, so it, it very much the project um, as we got into it was um, 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 amounted to uh, some or orchestrating a, a bunch of chaos. Um, so you know, the, the, the walls came down, the, the insulation starts coming out, and, and then soon we were working on everything at once. Uh, we were trying to figure out how to get everything removed, intact. You know, it was the drywall, insulation, the roof, the siding, windows, gas, electrical, and plumbing, um, the doors, fixtures, shower and bathtub, um, tile, the HVAC system, the, the frame, the, both the roof trusses and the walls. Um, and and so it was it was both figuring out how to get things out intact um, and then also learning how to take it take the the parts of the structure down safely um, all at the same time figuring out how our end markets were going to to work and figuring out how we we're going to store the materials um, uh, until we could get them moved so here's more of our our ongoing chaos uh, so we, we had some great help from um, neighbors and friends in the, the photo on the left. That's our neighbor, Gary. He um, has a, uh, a really strong um, uh, background in the trades. And so he was invaluable to us as we kind of figured out, like, how do we take the structure down? Where do we make our cuts? Um, you know, structure is solid. You know, you got to you got to cut somewhere and you know you want to do it in a way that is as safe um, as possible um, and, and you want to get the material out that you that you want so um, so he was wonderful and then we had friends um, show up on um, many a weekend to to help us especially with some of the the more challenging high up work um, which was wonderful so the windows um, they are on the, the list of uh, materials that are accepted at the Habitat for Humanity Restore. Um, our windows were stock windows. Um, they were not installed correctly in the first place. They were not, um, not easy to remove. And at the end of the day, I personally felt like, uh, even though we did donate them, um, I thought they had questionable integrity and value as a reused item. The wood. Wood was one of the just absolute gold mines that, that we had um, you know, from the project. Not only the, the siding that was the, the, the boxcar wood, um, but just, just all, all of the, the, the two by fours, four by sixes. Uh, we had a bunch of dimensional lumber. Um, you can see in this photo, um, Anthony is working to um, extract a four by 12 from a, um, an archway uh, in the house. Um, so the, the wood covered everything from your standard and dimensional lumber to engineered and treated wood, your OSB, your plywood. The, the engineered and treated wood and, and plywood, types of plywood, um, those all went in the, the roll-off container. There really wasn't a, um, a reuse 
market that we could figure out for those. Um, and then we, we did some uh, select sorting, denealing, um, storage, and then ultimately reuse. Um, but not, none of our wood, you know, it, we were able to just reuse just tons, tons of the wood. So here are some of our wood storage piles. Um, on the left, that's the, the dimensional lumber, the older true, true dimension um, lumber, and we use that in our new house. Um, the pile in the upper right corner, um, as we were taking the house down, it was a just throw it on there, throw it on there. And um, Anthony had the idea to uh, post it on Craigslist as a come you haul and take the, the wood, um, a buck a board for two by fours, um, five bucks a board for two by sixes and the material moved really fast. So the metal, we, we uh, separated out all the metal um, according to uh, material type for the higher uh, value items and we took it all down to Sims Metal for recycling. So this is my shout out to my kids for being amazing. That is my daughter actually asleep on a piece of T11, uh, T111 siding that's the, the ramp into our roll off container. And I, I checked, she was asleep, um, which was just, they, they put in so much and we're just troopers for this project. So the last room standing, we were actually able to keep our water running and keep our, our bathroom um, running up until the very end of the project. And then finally, the foundation, um, we jackhammered um, it all out, used the concrete saw to remove parts of uh, our driveway um, and um, hauled it load by load out to Kiefer Landfill where I work. So the final numbers, it took us about 50 days to deconstruct, 40 to, for the structure, 10 days for all the, the, um, the, uh, the foundation and approximately 500 hours of our labor. Uh, the bid we received from our uh, general contractor to demolish the house was $25,000. And between the cost we paid for the roll-off containers and what we made from the sale of materials, um, we were we, uh, made a small profit, probably not more than $1,000, but it was definitely in the positive. Um, the tonnage of mixed C&D debris that went to Green Waste of Sacramento was um, about 15 tons. Um, the tonnage we brought to uh, Kiefer Landfill of the concrete rubble was about 30 tons. And um, even though we don't have a scale on, on our property, um, you know, just based on the volume and the weight of the material that um, we moved, um, I estimate that we moved um, just ourselves over 30 tons of, um, of material for reuse and recycling. So the, the major takeaways for this project, so I'm, I'm not a, a recycling professional. Um, I am a, a landfill engineer, um, but I've been in this industry for um, my entire career. And um, you, know, you, you, you do learn some things and have some takeaways. So um, for the project, the, these were my main takeaways, um, that there was not um, any market driver to do this type of construction. We, we wanted to do it, uh, we saved some money, you know, we had the time to, to make it happen. Um, next, it is possible to get a lot of very high quality reuse and recycling from a very average house, which this house was. Um, and then there is very little education or support for homeowners that wanna take on something like this. We basically wrote our own, you know, playbook um, and learned as we went. Um, and then finally, um, it, was, it was a wild ride. It was a fantastic project that we loved doing, even though it was a very long and difficult 50 days and uh, we would do it again in a heartbeat. Wow, Rachel, thank you so much. So very impressive and the um, whole family involved. So I recognize that we're at the top of the hour and folks may want to move on. If you have a few questions for Rachel, uh, you know, definitely um, put them in the chat and we might be able to hang around for a few more minutes and um, come back um, and visit us on May 14th where we're going to have a, a, you know, our uh, safety webinar and we'll have our um, final capping uh, uh, presentation webinar for our last um, webinar of the year uh, coming up on uh, robotics and um, and uh, 
and uh, <laughs> and alternative technology, and that's coming up really up here in June 11th. So May 13th for safety, June 11th for alternative technology and robotics. And we really appreciate, well, thank you, shout out to each of our speakers for sharing your really valuable information. All of these presentations and the recording will be up on the um, swananorcal.org website. Thanks very much to Christine Wolf for operating behind the scenes and for everyone for coming today. We'll, uh, we'll, see, you, uh, we'll see you in May. All right, thanks a lot. And I'll stop the recording, but um, if folks have any questions, um, you can finish putting them in the chat.